Hey, how's it going? This is Gazelig for GrinderSchool.com. Here today with episode 10 of my How to Master MTT series. Uh, today we're going to be covering final table bubble play. We're going to go through some similarities and differences between the money bubble uh, that we talked about um, in previous episode and the uh, final table bubble uh, that we're going to cover today. Um, we're going to look at how to play the final table bubble with a short stack, with an average stack and with a big stack and the options you have available. Uh, we're going to look at some common mistakes and misconceptions and then some profitable conditions as well. So again, straight into it then. Similarities then with the um, in the money bubble. Um, weaker players uh, tighten up, uh, which we looked at before, and some will, will stall even uh, in hand-for-hand -hand play, uh, which really doesn't make any sense. Um, but um, it's one of the things to look out for is if players are stalling with, um, let's say, uh, in a nine-handed game, 11 players are left um, and there are some short stacks perhaps on the other table and you've got players on your table uh, using a lot of their time bank, um, then um, these would be the kind of players that are looking just to sort of scrape into the final table. Um, as we discussed before as well, better players will open up and adjust. Um, so it's good to know who's who's playing tight and who's uh, just trying to get into the final table and who's um, trying to take advantage of these tight players um, by opening up their game a bit. So the difference is then, uh, there's more at stake. Uh, weaker players tend to tighten up even more because they uh, really want to make the final table. Uh, errors are more heavily compounded since there's more money at stake now. Um, if you think about it, if you make an error at the final uh, final table bubble, um, you miss out on an opportunity to um, to, to win big um, by, by actually making the final table, given that um, you can't actually... Um, you know, come come first in the tournament if you get knocked out in eleventh eleventh place. Um, although that's pretty uh, straightforward, pretty uh, self-explanatory. Um, but it's more about dollar EV now. Um, we'll talk about this a bit later on. Um, you need to pick your spots uh, a bit better. Um, just be aware, uh, more aware of what's going on at the table. Um, so you, you should be looking to re-steal more for value. Uh, that's just an example. Again, we're thinking about dollar EV and not. Chip EV. It's quite difficult to discuss dollar EV away from the final table. Uh, we do talk about that, and we'll talk about that in the next episode, um, where it's, there's more of a focus on how much money you're actually making uh, rather than how many chips you have. Um, but here we need to kind of be a bit more uh, wary of, of how much um, uh, equity we, we lose by, by making certain plays. Um, and we shouldn't always be looking to make the best uh, plus chip EV play uh, now that we're close to the final table. Um, Hand for hand can last much longer um, than the final table bubble um, than hand for hand and the went in the money bubble, um, and also we're going to be playing uh, short handed, um, which means the blinds come around much faster, requires uh, much more aggression. I need to open up your game. You're going to be in late position much more often as well, um, so that's uh, something something to think about. Um, so final table bubble then short stack play. Uh, attack short and average stacked opponents. Uh, so th first example. Okay, so here's Hero um, with about twelve bigs um, on the on the button um, with some similar st size stacks behind. Um, it's a perfect opportunity to to put pressure on the other players uh, and pick up some chips here. Um, this is would be a standard uh, plus, plus chip EV spot. Um, Given um, the uh, the stack sizes and the you know the our stack size and the amount that's already in the pot, um, but it's just um, something that this is something that doesn't change um, in uh, the final table bubble. We should be trying still trying to apply pressure. And if we think about it, the range for these players to be able to call is going to be quite tight, or at least it, it should be. Um, so we can um, profitably shove in this spot. Now, if I just show you sit and go wizard. Um, at this moment it's suggesting that we shove 100% which is going to be plus chip EV. Now if we decided to change our edge uh, to, to make us at least uh, one small blind um, each time we shove it's still suggesting we should shove 100%. And this is given that these uh, players are going to be calling with 8.1% uh, with and 10%. Um, I've seen players that um, are not capable on the final table bubble of calling uh, this wide. Uh, not this is, this is going to affect anything at all, um, since um, it's already suggesting we shove 100% of hands. Um, but it's just something to consider now is that um, this is suggesting we should shove 100% of hands when they're calling with um, 
with 10%. Now I'd say that their, the range for call in here is going to be much, much tighter. It might be something more like this, which goes down to 6.2%. Um, but again, it doesn't, as I said, it doesn't have an effect on, on the uh, range of hands that we can shove because it's already suggesting we should shove 100% of hands. Um, so that's that. You should recognize that if you continue to fold, you'll just uh, blind out. So it's much better to be uh, to go out being bold and aggressive, um, just uh, you know playing really tight um, and, and blinding out. Um, here's an example again, uh, similar to um, a hand discussed in the Money Bubble uh, strategy. Can you just min raise and fold? If you've got weak tight um, players behind you who will just three bet the same range that they'll call off, um, then we can actually just min raise a uh, fold um, to any action. Um, so here's an example with ace five off suit. So here it is. Um, in similar, I guess we're both short stacks behind us. Um, but here, if we decide to shove, we're putting the maximum pressure on. Uh, but if we do get called in this spot, um, we're likely to be completely dominated by a better ace or by a um, pocket pair between five and aces, um, which means we've only got uh, th about 30% equity with our ace. Um, against against those pocket pairs, um, so I think it's much better in this particular spot um, to to min raise fold. Obviously, we can't keep doing this because it's going to become an exploitable strategy. Um, but we can, if we're going to be min raising here, we can then min raise our really strong hands as well, um, and also it creates um, a bit of an image that we're actually capable of uh, raise folding fourteen between twelve and fourteen big blinds, uh, which is not what some, uh, a lot of players will uh, will do. And then the final point here then, uh, re-stealing should be more for value. Um, it's not just about chip EV um, anymore, not just about making the most chips. Um, and I'll just show you this as an example. We have a uh, big stack here um, starting to, to open. He's going to be uh, opening a fairly wi uh, wide range in this, in this spot, um, given that he has uh, most chips at the table and we're uh, on, the, on the bubble. Final table bubble here. Um, now, if we're just looking at plus chip EV spots, then um, you know I can be shoving a much wider range than nines, given that he's going to be opening quite a lot. Um, but also think about um, the range of hands that he can still he can still uh, raise call with um, that are doing fairly well against our hand. You know, like um, suited Broadway hands, um, still going to be doing fairly well against against our hands so we need to um be uh, i th i feel on the on the fun table bubble three bet um three betting here and restealing uh, with a strong range so we're not essentially restealing we're just three betting for value um three betting all in uh and sometimes they'll uh, even call with uh, call with a weaker hand um here we've got the hand in the sit and go wizard um this is suggesting again this fairly tight range of hands that this player is opening and, and calling with. Um, if we feel that he is uh, has opened his game quite considerably, um, let's say that he's opening with forty percent of hands now. I'm just looking to put pressure on on all the other players at the table, um, and say that he decides to call off with these um, these hands just owing to the fact that he has a big stack. Um, if he raised calls against uh, Will Pang and, and me, it doesn't. It's not going to affect his uh, his chance in the tournament massively, um, and we it's suggesting then, for, in terms of uh, chippy V, that we can actually shove this range of hands. Um, you know, queen eight suited, jack eight suited, nine seven suited, pocket pairs, ace eight, etc. Now, that's a that's a a good range of hands to be to be shoving if we're uh, away from the final table, and uh, we're looking to to pick up chips at any any point. Um, but in this particular spot, um, the difference here um, for our partic uh, for let's just let's just choose one of these hands. Um, let's choose Jack Eight suited. Uh, the difference is just over a small blind. Now, um, they're between uh, whether we push or whether we whether we fold in this spot. So um, you know, the times when it works, yeah, it, it's brilliant, but. Um, the times when it doesn't work and we get eliminated um, on the bubble um, makes this uh, sort of a negative uh, dollar EV uh, proposition. So whilst it's plus chip EV to get it in in this spot, um, I would argue that it wouldn't be a good spot um, to get it in um, here. And I just much prefer to be um, three betting for value, which is why nines, when we look at it, 
uh, the difference here is actually almost four uh, big blinds, which is definitely good enough. Uh, we can take this down a little bit. Okay, so we get about three, just under three with sevens. Okay, and over two with with sixes. So it's just sort of the range of hands. Um, I would go with a much tighter range here, um, and be looking to to three bet for value. Um, in this spot. Right, so with an average stack then, um, I feel we should be attacking other average stacked and short stacked opponents, uh, putting the pressure on them. If there are short stacked opponents, um, that we can uh, put their tournament life on the line um, by shoving into them, um, they're going to have to fold uh, a large percentage of the time um, and we can put maximum pressure on them. Uh, we can also do that with uh, average size stacks as well in the sense that um, we but we can also dent uh, their stack, even though they might have a similar size stack to ours, and we can um, dent their chances uh, quite considerably by being aggressive against them. Um, but I feel we should avoid tangling with the big stacks if possible. Um, what you'll find if you're uh, playing aggressively is that eventually uh, someone's going to start playing back at you. And if you're being played back at by a big stack, then it's much better to tighten up and then be prepared to um, four bet. So I've got an example here with tens. So here, um, I have just under about 30 big blinds to start uh, the hand. Uh, the player to my left had been um, three betting um, quite a lot, so I decided to tighten up. And then if he decided to three bet again, um, I'd be qu uh, fairly, uh, well, completely happy getting it in with pocket tens in this spot. Um, again, I'm doing it with a with a very very strong hand. In that, you know, if he does decide to call um, for quite a large percentage of his of his stack. Um, he has, say, 45 bigs at the start of this uh, hand, uh, maybe a bit more. Um, he's, you know, we, we do uh, put a large dent into his uh, into his stack if he decides to call here. Um, uh, but because he's been through betting quite a lot, um, and I, I decided to tighten up my my range here, uh, pocket ten is definitely uh, good enough to to get it in here. Uh, so I decided to shove, and he just folds. Uh, and sometimes you'll find that he's just three betting a uh, you know a much a very very wide range. Um, but I, on a final table bubble, I'd much sooner uh, four bet um, hands that are very very strong, uh, which tens is. Uh, so we should look to still steal blinds and antes. Um, we should also. Um, with that in mind, play hands that are the play easier post flop uh, in case you get flatted out of the blinds. Uh, hands like suited connectors and Broadway hands. Uh, so here's an example with 8 7 suited. Actually, I've just realized it's 9 8 suited. Um, not that matters too much. Um, so here we decide to open. Um, and the, the big blind uh, who has about 27, 28 big blinds at the start of the hand. Um, decides to flat, um, it's, only, it's only costing him a big blind to call. Um, and if you think about it, he's, uh, he's sort of handcuffed with his stack size. Um, tr three betting all in with a 27 big blind stack is going to be be too much. Uh, but if he three bets, he's going to um, be put into a difficult spot if I decide to four bet. Um, so the sort of lower variance approach for him is, is going to be to, to flat here. And I would expect him to be flatting um, Broadway hands, uh, possibly some high suited connectors, um, but I think all other hands he would probably just uh, just fold in this spot. Now he may decide to three bet very strong hands. He might decide to to trap um, with aces and kings and queens. Um, you know, more likely uh, aces in this spot. Um, but we can't rule any hand out at this uh, at this moment. Uh, and the reason why I suggest we play nine eight suited because it plays easier post flop. He decides to check. Now we. Um, I always advocate betting uh, quite small at this stage of the tournament. Uh, we don't have to bet particularly big. Um, and we, we, you know, we're betting here with, with middle pair. Um, so I suppose in, in a sense, we against uh, against flush draws, we're we're betting for value. Um, but against a, a queen, uh, against other hands, we're kind of trying. To, we're betting as a as a as a bluff. Um, in the sense we're trying to represent this queen. Uh, so when he decides to flat here, um, uh, rather than shove it all in. Um, over our over our bet, um, we can sort of range him on uh, on spades uh, for the flush draw, ten jack, king jack, king ten, um, maybe just ace high if he feels that he's going to take advantage of me checking back a lot of turns, um, given the uh, shyness of the stacks um, this at this point. 
Um, so there's still quite a lot of hands in his, his range here. Um, when this uh, particular turn comes off, um, gives us now a flush draw. Uh, so we have a pair plus a plus a flush draw. Um, he decides to check again. Now what I did, don't want to do in this particular spot is to bet and then have to fold to a shove. Uh, I know I'm, I'm sitting quite comfortably with uh, uh, you know just under 100 bigs at the start of this hand. Um, but it doesn't mean that I have to uh, get crazy with it. And so I'd much sooner just check behind here. Uh, maybe induce a bluff if you know no spade comes off, no uh, Broadway card comes off, um, and get to a a, a cheap showdown. Uh, so the two of hearts comes. I don't expect him to have many twos in his range. I suppose ace two suited um, is possible. Um, so when he decides to lead out for about two thirds pot, um, I just need to think about the ha range of hands uh, that he could be doing this with. Um, obviously the uh, 10 jack, king jack, king 10, all of those draws missed, um, spade draws missed. Um, so whilst he could be um, betting his uh, very strong hands uh, like, like twos or a set of nines, um, or king queen, queen jack, um, ace queen even, um, there are a number of hands that that completely um, that missed on this on this river, uh, which is why I feel perfectly comfortable um, calling with with second pair here. Uh, he shows ace, uh, just ace, ace high. Well, a pair of twos with ace kicker, um, and he, as I said, at this, um, as we were going through this hand, he uh, tried to seize on um, my my check back on the turn, um, showing a bit of um, sort of weakness. And he tried to take advantage of that by making a fairly sizable bet on the river. Um, that's just an example of how we can play uh, pseudo connectors, how they're easier to play post flop than a hand like uh, King Three off suit. Um, just gives us more more options um, to play a hand post flop. So on to uh, the big stack play then. Uh, you should be opening a lot and putting pressure on medium and aver well, average size stacks. Uh, this means sort of three betting in position, um, looking to three bet 20 to 25 to 35 big blind stacks, um, sort of, yeah, three betting average average size stacks. Um, some players will, will raise fold uh, 20 big blind stacks so you can three bet them um, because you're going to be putting them into a, a spot where they have to four bet or fold. Um, so that's going to be really, really profitable. Uh, look to shove much wider versus short stacks trying to make the final table. Um, I'm going to show you this in a sit and go with it in a minute how tightening up ranges behind can uh, affect our, sh our own shoving range, uh, especially on the final table bubble. Uh, and also this final point, be aware of how much of your stack you're committing to each play. Um, so if you're deciding to uh, three bet uh, call a particular uh, stack, just be aware of how that affects your stack size. Uh, will, you some, you know, will you go down from 55 bigs to 20 bigs? Um, by making a more marginal play. Um, marginal plays need to be uh, avoided at this stage of the tournament. Um, and you should be looking to, whilst you can still look to, to capitalize on um, getting other players to, to make mistakes and, and getting them to fold as a, a large percentage of the time, um, owing to the fact that they're gonna tighten up because it's a final table bubble, um, we shouldn't be looking to take two uh, marginal spots. So let's go into sit and go wizard. Okay, we're in Universal Replay uh, first. Here's the hand, 7-2 um, off suit. I've used this uh, just to kind of make a point. Um, so it comes around to us. We've got a really, uh, really big chip lead here. And these three players behind us have been playing really, really tight. Um, so I just want to show you how uh, tightening up all their three, these three players' range uh, ranges uh, can affect our shoving range. So we're going to sit and go wizard. Um, at the moment... Uh, suggesting we should only be um, shoving 10s, ace-king, ace-queen suited. Um, plus, if we select um, very tight for each of these each of these players, um, oops, I'm gonna do that. Okay, um, our range has, um, I believe, got um, tighter, which doesn't make much sense. Um, Let's just try this again. Oh, I see the problem. Right, okay, so this edge here. So if we change this, um, then we're gonna um, be getting a lot more um, 
a lot more hands in our range to shove. Sorry about that. Um, so this edge was set for um, to be over two big blinds. And I guess the reason why is because our stack size is so large at this point. Uh, we don't want to be putting ourselves to too many um, negative uh, EV spots, uh, given the uh, the other stacks at the table. Um, but as you can see, so this is suggesting um, if we just, again, went for a small blind um, increase over time um, with average stack, average calling ranges behind us, then uh, suggesting we should be shoving with this wider range. Now, if I, again, let's try this again, um, change it to very tight, look, uh, sort of suddenly changing to uh, pushing 100% of hands. And the reason why um, it's gonna be uh, profitable to shove 100% of hands here um, is because of the, because players behind are gonna be uh, tightening up so much. Now, we could change this to um, just tight and see if that has any any sort of effect. Okay, as you can see, it doesn't. So even if this player behind us is calling with this range of hands on the uh, final table bubble, um, which you know um, could definitely definitely see, um, then we uh, we're still still good to be uh, shoving 100% of hands here. Okay, so that's just an example of how when players tighten up so much is that we can actually shove uh, any two cards, uh, and it can still be uh, profitable. Um, especially when we have a big stack and we can put pressure on uh, on our opponents. So some common mistakes and misconceptions and I, I see all the time. Tightening up too much on the final table, much better to be aggressive in this spot, um, but in the right sort of way. Um, so looking to um, shove against uh, more vulnerable stacks rather than shoving into a, into a big stack uh, who's going to call wider. Um, I've seen um, players and students not adjusting to the changing dynamics um, so if a player is suddenly playing back at you, um, you need to sort of uh, address that by perhaps tightening up and then being prepared to fall back like I discussed earlier. Um, and then uh, people are just unaware that play is shorthanded, so the blinds are going to hit you more often um, and you, uh, you're going to be in late position more often so you can look to, look to steal more. Profitable conditions then, uh, expl exploit weaker players by race folding versus them since their ranges are much tighter. Um, you know, on the final table bubble, they're going to be uh, three bet shoving um, or three betting with a very, uh, very tight range, very strong range. Um, so we can uh, profitably raise fold against them uh, with any two cards. Um, watch out for players raise folding a 20 big blind stack. Definitely make notes at this point. Um, if you see players with 16 bigs raise folding, um, then make a note of it. Look to try and exploit that um, by uh, three three betting a. Uh, a wider range. Now I know I said at the start um, or towards the start of the video that we should be three betting a um, three betting more for value. Um, but if you have a if you have a big stack, uh, then you can definitely apply pressure to um, shorter stacks in that spot. Um, look to abuse position. Uh, you'll be able to put a lot of pressure on players uh, post flop, uh, not just pre flop. That we've uh, I know we've discussed quite a lot um, in this um, episode. Uh, but look to play pots in position and look to exploit players' tendencies, whether they, you know, they see about the flop too much, that they don't uh, see about the turn enough. Um, things that we've discussed in previous episodes. Uh, look for players not defending their blinds and steal from them liberally. And then isolate weaker players who are limping even at this stage. Uh, and it does happen and it's it's quite amazing. Uh, but take notes as well, just in case, um, you know, there are tight players who decide to limp very strong hands. And that tends to happen um, quite a lot when approaching the final table as well. So just to recap then, um, you should look to be playing more aggressively but in the right way. We've gone through ways in which we can we can do that. Um, we should attack the appropriate size stack based on our stack size. Um, recognize that play is short-handed. We should play hands that are easy to play post-flop, Broadway hands, pseudo connectors, things like that. Um, and be careful about taking plus 2 PV spots and start to think more about dollar EV. Um, this is going to be really, really important, and we go into this in the next episode as well. Okay, so um, as always, if there are any questions, comments, please let me know. Um, this has been Gazelig for grinderscore.com. Signing off. Cheers, guys. Take care. Bye.